Welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast to provide legal information and updates to individuals, business owners and business advisors in South Australia. This podcast is brought to you by Mellor Olson Lawyers, a full service South Australian law firm. The information, opinions and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only and do not constitute legal advice in any way. Reliance on the information contained in this podcast is done so at your own risk. In today's episode, we're talking with Mellor Olson partner, John Love. John is an employment and workplace lawyer. Welcome, John. Hi, Lucy. John, I've asked you along today to discuss the employment life cycle. So what I'm hoping to cover with you is from recruitment to exit and everything in between. So where do we start? Well, today we'll focus on employers covered by the federal system. And in South Australia, that is the entire private sector. Um, Before hiring a new employee, um, it's important for an employer to know their rights and responsibilities. And the starting point is what's called the National Employment Standards, which are a set of 11 minimum employment entitlements that must be provided to all employees, irrespective of that employee is the CEO or an administrative assistant that works in the office. And there's also a federal minimum wage that needs to be complied with. Okay, so what about selecting talent? What needs to be considered? When selecting candidates, um, there are legal considerations which need to be taken into account. Starting point, selection criteria should not be based on any um, um, discriminatory factors. Um, so for example, it's, against, it's unlawful for an employer to discriminate on uh, the basis of certain inherent characteristics or attributes like gender, age, disability, um, race, ethnic background when determining whether someone should be offered employment. There are also many other attributes um, that are considered unlawful that an employer can't rely on in making a decision about who to employ and who not to employ. Okay, and what's next? Where do we go from there? Uh, Once an employee commences, it's really important to manage expectations. Um, um, It's it's critical, I think, that um, an employment contract is provided in some form to the employee so that both parties know what the rules are of the relationship and if If possible, I think it's also ideal for an employer to provide some sort of position description or job description, uh, which doesn't have to be too complicated, that that, that makes it clear what the expectations of the position are. Okay. Um, Does the organisation need to provide um, organisational policies or induction processes? How do we make sure that we safely onboard our our team? Look, I think some form of induction is is sensible. Obviously, that would depend on the size and the nature of the organisation as to what extent and how and how detailed that induction is. Um, that's a critical part of the um, recruitment process. But also, an employer should have a suite of policies and procedures. Again, that will the complexity of that will vary on the size of the employer. And um, but it's also important to have those things codified before an employee starts employment. Okay. So we've employed somebody, they've got their policies, we've got an agreed upon position description. Should management be regularly checking in with team members? Oh, absolutely. Look, employers um, should be reminded of um, their their expectations um, and regular discussions um, and check-ins should always occur, particularly with new employees who might be feeling quite insecure about the employment and their performance and to make sure that the relationship's as positive as it can be. Okay. Before we discuss managing leave and leave entitlements, can we talk about some of those unexpected things that pop up in life, such as illness or injury? Um, What do you need to consider as an employer? Yeah, look, managing injured employees is one of the most difficult areas for employers. Um, There are so many different considerations that can be taken into account um, legally um, and so many risks for an employer if they don't manage it properly. Um, There's a whole range of legal risks for an employer to consider. What are some of those legal risks? Well, just to cover some of them, for example, it's unlawful to dismiss an employee for what's known as a temporary absence from work due to illness or injury, and that's irrespective of if it's a work-related injury or not. Um, so while it's not unlawful to dismiss an employee not related to an illness or injury, many employees still take their employee employer to court and argue that the real reason was the illness or injury, um, even though it was just coincidental. Uh, To mitigate these risks, an employer should never dismiss an employee because of the illness or because they're absent from the illness unless they've sought um, um, legal advice beforehand. Okay, so let's talk about leave. Throughout the employment, staff will be wanting to and expect to take many forms of leave. In fact, it's important that they do so. Can we flesh that out a bit? Mm. So the, the, 
National Employment Standards deal with leave for all employees in the private sector in South Australia. Um, and just to give, uh, to run through them all, um, the National Employment Standards provides the following leave, parental leave, four weeks of annual leave per year, 10 days of personal and carers leave a year, um, currently unpaid family domestic violence leave, and also some community service leave. Um, long service leave is dealt with in a different, um, at a different level. It's for most employees and employers, it's dealt with in state legislation. Okay. So each of these probably would have different eligibility criteria, is that correct? Correct. And each, um, each, each type of leave has very different rules as to when it can be accessed. And, and they also have rules around notice and evidence requirements for taking that leave. Okay. So let's start with parental leave, if we can. When can it be taken? So parental leave can be taken when an employee gives birth or an employee's spouse or a de facto gives birth or an employee adopts a child that's under the age of 16. Okay, and how much parental leave are employees entitled to? So each eligible member of an, what's called an employee couple is entitled to up to 12 months of unpaid parental leave with an option to request an additional 12 months of leave by agreement with their employer. Um, but again, the employer can deny that additional 12 months on reasonable business grounds. There's also a federal um, paid parental leave scheme, um, which I believe is um, means tested, which provides for up to 18 weeks at the minimum wage for el eligible employees. John, can you ask employees to perform any duties while on parental leave? Yeah, look, there are limited um, circumstances in which you can. Um, they're called keeping in touch days, which um, an employee, if they agree, can perform up to 10 keeping in touch work days while they're on parental leave. And they're a really useful tool to allow the employer to keep contact with an employee who may be on up to 12 months unpaid parental leave to keep in touch with the workplace um, and know what's going on in their absence. Yeah. Um, I guess we're moving into the area of some reasons why people may exit employment. We've talked about leave. What about when it comes to having those difficult or crucial conversations? Where should you start and what should you be mindful of? I think it's important for employers to have clear policies and procedures to deal with poor performance and poor behaviour in the workplace as a starting point. And my advice always is that if there are warning signs around people's behaviour or performance to get in early and have a conversation to see if they can be effectively nipped in the bud early in the piece before they become much more serious. Yeah. So before tackling those conversations, get all the information? Correct. Okay. So John, we've talked about um, some leave entitlements, we've talked about the on onboarding process, and we've talked a little bit about the management of performance and those crucial conversations. So what are some of the ways in which employment can end? Yeah, look, there are many different ways that an employment relationship can end. Um, an employee can resign, uh, they can retire, which is just another way of resigning. They can be dismissed from their position by the employer at the employer's initiative, um, or they can be made redundant, which is a, another version of being dismissed by your employer. Okay, so I'm thinking about the, the business owners here. Let's start with resignation. What are some of the obligations of the employer when it comes to a resignation? Yeah, so if an employee resigns, um, the first thing to do really, uh, assuming the employer um, doesn't want to try and change the employee's mind, is mm -hmm. to acknowledge that resignation. Um, the employer should check that the employee is given the correct notice of, to end the employment. Um, and if they haven't, that might involve a, a further discussion with the employee about giving the correct notice. Um, and that the way to check that is to check what's in the employment contract. Um, that notice period can only be varied by agreement between the parties. Um, and also the parties might have a chat about either finishing up earlier or even extending the notice period depending on the nature of the workplace and the demands and the needs of both parties. Okay, and what about some entitlements? Would there be some entitlements when you finish up? Yeah, so an employer is required to pay out any unused and accrued annual leave at the end of employment. Um, also, if the employee has over seven years service, there may well also be some long service leave. Are they, do they pay out the um, sick leave or is that sort of lost? No, sick leave doesn't get paid out typically on termination. Yep. Um, there's some, in some workplaces that occurs, but it's very few workplaces that occurs and the employer in those circumstances would be, would be aware of that because it's quite an unusual requirement for sick leave to be paid out. Okay. Um, so, so we talked about uh, their annual leave. What else is covered? Uh, long service leave needs yep. to be paid out if the employee has more than seven years service. Um, obviously outstanding wages up until the last day they work and depending on what's been agreed and negotiated there might be some of the notice period that needs to get paid out in lieu after the employment ends as well. Okay, so what about dismissal? Okay, um, so dismissal effectively is when the employer makes the decision to end the employment at their initiative. Um, if an employee is being dismissed it's critical that the employer has a valid reason to end the employment 
um, and this is all to minimise their risks of an unfair dismissal claim. A dismissal normally falls into one of four categories, capacity, performance, misconduct or redundancy. Um, um, most employees in Australia um, have access to unfair dismissal protection and if they take out such an application, the Fair Work Commission will review the dismissal to make sure that it's both procedurally fair and that there was a valid reason for the dismissal as well. I understand that dismissal might at times be quite a challenging thing for employers to do. Um, many businesses that are large enough to have HR managers or people and culture managers or even consult with you know, someone like yourself before they enter in the dismissal would uh, get some guidance around that process. Is there something available for these smaller businesses that you would recommend that they just make themselves familiar with before they enter into a dismissal? Yeah, look, if they're a small business employer, there's slightly different rules that apply in relation to terminating employees and there's information available about that publicly on the Fair Work um, Ombudsman website, um, which can be easily accessed. Um, but generally speaking, I recommend most employers before dismissing an employee, um, it pays to just um, take half an hour to get some advice and get it uh, get it checked by an expert because um, that's the best way to minimise your risks. Okay. What about redundancy? So redundancy is where the employer has made a decision that the person's position is no longer required. It's a really important distinction. It's not a person that's made redundant, it's a position that's made redundant and that may lead to that person losing their job. And so if the employer is has more than 15, employ, 15 or more employees, there may well be redundancy pay that needs to be paid to that employee um, based on length of service. Um, and there may well also be a notice period as well that needs to be complied with. And the notice period can either be paid out in lieu or the employee can work through the notice period or part paid out and part worked through. If a redundancy is a genuine dismissal, then the employee um, will be unsuccessful if they decide to bring a fair, uh, an unfair dismissal application. Right, but say, you know, the business said that the role was, you know, made redundant and then, you know, a few weeks later you see the role almost identical to yours um, advertised, then there might be a... Well, that would bring into question whether it was actually a genuine redundancy mm -hmm. in the sense that the, the, the employer didn't abolish the position. Mm -hmm. So if that, in that hypothetical, that employer would may have some difficulty if that employee brings an unfair dismissal. So to just maybe seek that advice depending on which pathway you're going down. I think so. I think so. I, um, finally, which I think is a lovely part of the employment life cycle, is what needs to be considered when somebody retires? Yeah, look, we see less and less of this now um, with the age discrimination requirements that apply at state and federal level. Um, so compulsory retirement doesn't occur in many industries anymore, except for some specific industries. <coughs> um, generally speaking, it's unlawful for an employer to simply have a rule that says you must retire at this age. Um, if there are concerns about an employee's ability to perform their role that might be related to their age, then an employer needs to deal with that on the basis of the employee's capacity to do the job, not solely on the basis of their age. And given the inherent complexities in those sorts of matters, I would always encourage an employer who had concerns about an elderly employee's ability to do the job to seek advice before embarking on a discussion or a process um, about ending the employment. Okay. Any final advice before we finish off, John? It's a really good idea for an employer to have some form of exit procedure in place, even if it's not particularly complicated. Um, that might deal with things like um, property to be returned. Quite often employers will issue mobile phones, laptop computers, keys, passwords, codes, etc. or there might be hard copy documents that they need to be returned to the employer. Um, giving the employee a reminder as well about even after the employment ends, they'll still owe that employer some obligations about confidentiality and keeping information secret. And in certain circumstances, there might even be a restraint on the employee um, doing certain activities after their employment that the employer might want to remind them of. And I also think it's a good opportunity in the exit, having as part of your exit procedure, an opportunity for the employee to give some feedback about their employment and for the employer then to factor into how they run their business. So we kind of loop back around to that initial employment contract where I'd imagine that all of these things are detailed in your employment contract when you're you know, coming on board, you're all excited and you're not thinking about your exit. But the reality is everything about your exit is probably in that contract. Yeah, that's right. And it's a good opportunity at the end of the employment in a friendly way to remind the employee about those obligations because they are, I think, often easily forgotten.
Oh, wow. Well, certainly um, a lot to think about. I'd like to thank John from Mellor Olsen for his time today. Thank you. The information in this podcast is general in nature. For podcast terms and conditions, for more information on John or Employment and Workplace Law or Mellor Olsen Lawyers, visit molawyers.com.au.